And then I would like to officially welcome uh, everybody here in the, in the virtual meeting room right now. And also everybody who's going to listen to the lecture um, at a later point via our YouTube channel. Our today's uh, speaker is um, Manuel Basia, who holds the chair of um, history of global history uh, at the University of Leeds. He has received his PhD in history in 2005 from the University of Essex. And ever since he has authored um, almost a countless number of uh, papers and book chapters, and also four um, monographies, as well as a co-written book. Just this year, he received uh, the Paul E. Lovejoy Prize of the Journal of Global Slavery for the best scholarly work in the field of slavery published in 2020 for his book, The Yellow Demon of Fever, Fighting Disease in the 19th Century Atlantic Slave. And um, if I'm not entirely mistaken, his today's lecture will touch upon some of these um, aspects that he uh, discusses in his book, as it is um, going to be about um, healing. So whenever you are ready, we are too, and we are very much looking forward to listen to your presentation. Okay, Janine, uh, thank you very much. And thanks everybody for, for coming. Um, this is the first paper I give in month. So, um, it's gonna be interesting. I almost forgot how to do this. Um, I, I want to start by thanking the, the I have some acknowledgements here to, to, to thank the, the Bond Center for Dependency and, and Slavery Studies, of, of which by the way, I'm now an affiliated scholar. And um, I would like to, to thank Jan Horber, um, Stephen Connerman, who may or may not come in later, and Janine as well, uh, for, for the constant communication and, and the support to, to put this together. Um, so as, as Yanni was saying, this uh, the talk that I'm going to, to give today, which is entitled The Art of Healing, and this is just a random nom name that I chose. It's, it's not necessarily um, uh, the, the, what, what the, the talk is going to be about. Uh, so basically, I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, a, an important part of, of um, uh, this book of the, the Yellow Demon of Fever, the book that um, I won the award. Uh, recently, uh, that was published last year, um, and um, I'm going to try to focus on African medical practitioners today. Uh, this, this is what I want to talk about. I wanted to just to ramble a little bit, and hopefully by the time that I'm done, we, we can have a discussion. You, you may have questions, comments, criticism, anything you feel like, so please uh, do not hesitate in, in, in shooting my way. So um, this, this book is, is a book about, about the struggle against disease in the 19th century, illegal transatlantic slave trade. Um, we have uh, Michael Soiske here, uh, and, and, and probably he's gonna hate me for saying this, but I really, really, really was tempted of calling this, uh, instead of illegal slave trade, to call it uh, the hidden Atlantic. Uh, I had a huge discussion with, with editors, et cetera, et cetera. One day I tell you a story, Mitchell. Uh, but it's, it's pretty much uh, the, this, this uh, hidden Atlantic war that uh, Mikhail Soiske has um, uh, written quite a lot and, and discussed widely. Uh, I also, more recently, I decided not to call it hidden Atlantic either, Mitchell. So I, I basically went to a third category, which I realized when I'm teaching has a, a, a deep effect on, on my students, maybe because it rings um, uh, closer, it rings perhaps closer to, to, to what, what is happening in the world today. And um, I'm calling it now human trafficking, transatlantic human trafficking. And basically it is human trafficking in the sense that this is going to be legal uh, in the 19th century by almost all definitions. And, and therefore, yeah, it's. That's, that's a way I'm looking at it right now. Whenever I'm talking about the, the slave trade, I tend to replace it for human trafficking now. Anyway, uh, this, this, is, this book was, um, I, I probably should say a, a word or two about how I ended up here because I never wrote about medical history before. I'm not a medical historian and I, I don't think I'm going to be one. So I'm kind of, um, uh, I'm kind of trespassing, <laughs> if you wish, in this, in this field. So for me, this was kind of a, a journey of discovery as, as a scholar. For many, many years, I have been working on, on the experiences of Africans in the diaspora. And at some point I started also um, writing about the Africans in Africa. And um, 
over all these years, since the 1990s that I started working on archives, in archives, I, um, I started accumulating notes and, and references about uh, different aspects of, of medical history uh, related to the experience of Africans. First in Cuba, then in Cuba and Brazil, and eventually all over the Atlantic and, and also in the, in the Indian Ocean uh, to that extent. And so at some point I actually faced myself, I found myself trying to, to make a decision, having to make a decision of whether I would, I would write something about this. I had enough material to write. It was clear to me. I didn't have a clue of how to go about it, by the way, but um, I had a lot of help. I had a lot of people who, who actually gave me hints and, and share bibliography with me and theory, et cetera. So basically, and, and uh, I had to decide whether to, to write a book about this or whether to write a couple of articles about this or just to use it as, as snippets in the rest of my research. And, and eventually I decided to write a book uh, to a large extent, thanks to an editor in Yale University Press who pretty much told me this, this, this is something that probably is worth doing. Um, I did not expect the, the, the book to come out in the middle of a pandemic, of a global pandemic. Um, I did not expect it to have spent years of my life reading about medical um, discussions about uh, anxieties and fears of people who live all over the Atlantic and suddenly find myself actually having kind of the same fears and anxieties and, and looking at the uh, and reading newspapers and seeing the same kind of, of discussions and wondering why people can be so stupid sometimes. Um, I'm so ignorant and, and unfortunately I, I, I tend to be blunt by the way I, I tend to think, say things the way they come to my head so sorry um, so the, the links to, to today um, events are, are very um, obvious in the book it's, it's and, and everything that I did and one of and I'm going to tell you an anecdote one of the first things that I remember uh, coming across was the, how Chinese doctors at the beginning of the pandemic were dismissed. Whatever they would say about, about how to contain this, this, this pandemic was dismissed until some European or, or American doctor would come up and say the same thing. And then there would, there would be, the, their opinions would be accepted and, and face mask being a, a case in question, by the way. Uh, so this, this same kind of, of um, discourse of uh, Europeans actually, or, or Westerners more broadly, uh, their opinion being taken into, into account and being disseminated and shared and, and, and accept, accepted uh, is, is pretty much uh, almost a carbon copy of what I saw while studying 19th century Atlantic, right? Um, so basically, to, to start getting into content, one of the th first things that I realized I had to do by studying um, uh, African practitioners in, in, in the 19th century, in the Atlantic world, uh, was to try to avoid this uh, romantic narrative of the Western white medical practitioner or, or missionary or, or whoever, um, superheroing his way or her way through the Black Atlantic, which is, which is a narrative that is, it was very common um, until a few years ago. Um, and Unfortunately, we still see it sometimes, and, and there is a recent case um, that I cannot help but mentioning uh, when, when the, a, a group of Oxfam workers in Haiti were accused of um, different crimes, and, and quite a few intellectuals, including historians, justify them because they were, that they were very good people, but they were acting on the duress in a, in a, in a disaster zone. I will never forget this. So these, these things still happen. To certain extent. Uh, so instead, I decided to focus on ordinary lives, ordinary events, uh, ordinary people um, that contributed to transform the medical cultures of the Atlantic in the 19th century. <clears throat> and they, they did that with, with, their, with their, um, their knowledge, basically. So this is a transnational, transimperial history, if you wish, uh, in which um, Africans, they, um, um, they have a, 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 they are in an equal, uh, ground with with uh, Westerners in this period. So these these people they actually had to deal with a lot of um, diseases that they were um, hard to um, diagnose, um, hard to um, uh, even identify. I, I some of them were, were easier to identify. For instance, uh, when people had smallpox or or yellow fever or ophthalmia, they were 
um, able to, to pinpoint what the disease was and according to the knowledge of the time, what they could do to, to stop it. But very often they were not able to, to realize what they have. Actually, today we have the same problems uh, to a certain extent again. And, and for instance, when it came to fevers, there were so many ty types of fevers with similar symptoms that they were not able to actually decide uh, what was the, 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 uh, the appropriate treatment for, for specific fever or what was a specific fever in, in general. And if you cannot diagnose, you cannot actually have a prognosis or, or, or a, 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 the proper therapy. Um, a, a classic example with this is that the two most um, uh, uh, common fevers in, in, in along the, the, the west and west central coast of Africa were uh, malaria and, and typhoid fever. Very similar symptoms, but the treatment for, for both of them is completely different. So at some point, people would start using quinine to treat uh, patients with them. Um, with typhoid fever, and of course, this, this didn't work at all. So they they are going to have to deal with these things, and and uh, uh, they are going to do the best they can according to the knowledge they had uh, at the time. And I have to make something very clear: medical knowledge is going to circulate both ways, and I'm going to, to emphasize this in a minute. But um, this medical knowledge, knowledge coming from every side is equally problematic, and very often European doctors or Western doctors they are just as lost as their African counterparts and vice versa. So it's not there is not real superiority, even though the, the Westerners, they would tell you that there was, that the, that the knowledge was superior and, and they are going to claim uh, it is. Um, something that became very clear very early on is that Westerners, Western doctors and medical practitioners will have failed miserably to deal with many uh, of these diseases um, without the active and crucial participation and collaboration um, and, and knowledge exchanges changes coming from, from their African counterparts. Uh, so of course, um, uh, most, of the, most, of, most of the information that we have was written, recorded by Westerners, not by Africans. Not the absolute, um, uh, not absolutely, but, but uh, very closely. And, but, and, and they are going to record uh, these, these interactions in, our, in a variety of ways, but it is clear um, even from, from problematic accounts that this is a story of collaboration, a story of exchanges, um, uh, of exchanges of knowledge uh, that, that is gonna take place in Africa and if in the African diaspora and it's gonna take place on both sides of the slave trade or the human trafficking conflict. Um, uh, this, this uh, my, my work, what I, what I tried to do was also an, an attempt to bring um, that African knowledge and, and, and these African practitioners into an analytical framework that considers them um, as the crucial actors that they were. So this, this is something that I really um, set out to do. So African, the Africans, of course, were perceived as back, backward. Um, they were uh, very often calling on civilized, hidden, hidden uh, and Africa, of course, as you probably know, even today, uh, in, in many quarters, was considered to be a dangerous place, especially for white people, um, uh, a place where people didn't want to go to, uh, Africans where, where people they didn't want to come into contact with as well. Um, Africa was considered to be a repository of disease, very often referred to as the, as a white man's grave. Um, Africans were referred to as people with lack of discipline, uh, with a lower IQ, and, and again, these are, these are monikers that even today um, you, can, you can see in, in the press. And, and, and unfortunately, that's, it's, it's not uncommon until today. So we, we know a lot about the fears of Westerners, the fear that Westerners had of dying of tropical diseases associated with the transatlantic slave trade, uh, both in Africa and the rest of the Atlantic. And yet we know very little, even today, we know very little about the fears of the Africans because they didn't write about it. So it's, it, uh, it's, it's fair to say that they also struggle with these diseases, that they also were scared of dying, and yet we don't have this, um, this anxieties and these fears recorded by, by themselves in the same way that we have, uh, we have them by, by Europeans. I have probably should, should make a parenthesis here very quickly, just to mention that the period that I'm studying, which is the illegal slave trade or, or human trafficking after, after abolition efforts begin, in the late 18th century, early 19th century, happens to coincide with a romantic period, right? I was talking about Beethoven before you guys came in 
So this this is the romantic period. This is Geth, Beethoven. You know, there is the, this this romanticizing of everything that happens, and death from tropical diseases to a certain extent fit that model, if you wish, or that th 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 those ideals very well. There, there were diseases like, for instance, sleeping sickness. Uh, that whenever they were described by by, by Western uh, visitors or, or uh, doctors, were um, uh, beautified, if you wish, uh, as the way in which people would go away slowly and they would uh, keep their features um, uh, still very much as if they were alive. They were like becoming statues. You, you get all these descriptions. Um, some other diseases, of course, like dysentery, were never in, had nothing to do with romanticism. Um, so, in order to, to look into African practitioners, I, I focus on three specific spaces and, and, and the reason that the ways in which I divided these spaces were determined by the amount of information I had um, about each of them. So, I looked at um, slave trade ships and factories altogether. I, look, I looked at um, anti slave trade ship patrols, and I also looked at anti slave trade. Uh, reception centers, the places where, where liberated Africans were taken, uh, taken when, once they have been uh, taken away from, from human traffickers. Um, so the, 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 the slave, all, all three, by the way, are um, uh, aware um, uh, contact zones in, in the sense of uh, Mary Louise Pratt's uh, concept, places where People came together, people from different cultures, different backgrounds, they came together and they exchange uh, um, words, they exchange uh, body fluids, they exchange food, knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in, in the slave, on, on the slave trade ships and factories, there were um, particularly poor uh, medical facilities, almost always. Uh, there was a very poor medical provision and, and hygiene and, and overcrowding. The poor hygiene and overcrowding were very, very common. Uh, you have to understand that the, um, uh, human traffickers were driven uh, uh, by, by, by the need of profits and, and the way that the human trafficking in this period is going to take place under, under the pressure from abolition uh, and engaged ships and, and, and nations. Is going to force them to carry out their activities on the ground and very often in a rush, which don't allow them for the, the sort of medical examinations uh, that, that they would do in the past. Um, so we have, um, I, I was able to find, and I'm not the first person, I don't claim to do anything here for the first time, by the way. Um, uh, I was able to find quite a lot of uh, local healers in, in, in this uh, outpost along the African coast and even on the other side of Atlantic African um, practitioners. And um, some of them that were uh, even uh, tasked with being the, the surgeons on, on, on slave ships. And this is a particularly the case in Brazil where they even had a name for them, Sangradores. Uh, so I also looked at anti-slave trade, uh, anti trade ship patrols, um, which were the first line of containment when it came to, a, to, a, to a, the transition from uh, the illegal um, Atlantic to, or the hidden Atlantic to use uh, Mitch's words to term to, to, the, to this legal Atlantic that was imposed by different European nations, mostly the, the, the British. But at this time, the British are probably the, the main, or at least for most of the period, they are the main driving force behind abolitionist efforts in the Atlantic. But the French, the Americans, the, the Portuguese, the Brazilians, they, even the Spanish, at some point, they are, they are actually detaching ships to, to, to pursue and, and capture slave, uh, slave ships. Uh, so in these, in these um, ships that were the first line of containment, where very often they came into contact with, um, with uh, slave ships and, and had to treat um, the Africans, and, and so very often the, the slave traders on board, um, Africans also are going to play a very important role. Sometimes they're actually part of the crews of the, the slave trade ships, although most of them tend to, to have European surgeons. Um, but very often they, they are also going to be um, uh, on board of the slave ships that they are captured by the British or the Americans or the French, and immediately are going to start contributing to the knowledge um, uh, of how to treat diseases uh, as soon as, as the, the surgeons on, on on, on, on patrol ships come into contact with them, they, they start discussing the best way of, of going about treating diseases. 
Finally, and last but not least, we have the anti-slave trade reception centers, which are established in different parts of the Atlantic uh, after by some military courts and, um, and mixed commission courts when it comes to the British, but also the French and, and, and the Portuguese are gonna have their own, their, their own reception centers. Um, uh, so here, medical supplies, uh, medical facilities, infrastructure is going to be better. Uh, there's going to be more hygiene, uh, when it comes to, to receiving um, Africans, uh, and uh, but, but the citizens are going to create, to, to cause ho havoc um, uh, very often. Uh, but, but Africans here are going to be engaged in various different levels of um, uh, uh, medical practice uh, from, uh, in some cases, they are going to become actual surgeons. Some of them actually study in Europe, in, in the UK, mostly in Edinburgh. Um, but they are very often going to be in charge of pharmacies. They are going to be um, uh, dresses. They are going dresses, but in reality, the dresses are more like, like um, uh, nurses who are going to attend the sick. They are going to be tasked with, with the most difficult uh, work in hospitals and in, in, in their reception centers in general. And their skills sometimes are going to be recognized and sometimes are going to be mocked by, by Europeans, right? So. Um, one of our way, one of our ways th these Africans are going to contribute to, to um, the, uh, the changes in medical cultures in, in the 19th century is going to be through their pharmacopoeia. They are also going to have surgical knowledge that is worth mentioning here, and I will get there. Uh, but, but the knowledge of plants, uh, of medicinal plants, is going to be fundamental, both in Africa and in the Americas. And, and there is this brilliant book by Judith Carnet and, and Carnet and Rosomov in which they actually examine the, 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 the medical transfers or plant transfers from Africa to the Americas, which they, if I recall what they referred to as, as, as the Americas is kind of a, of, of a mirror um, uh, of um, a botanical mirror of, of Africa. And to a certain extent it was, both continents were together until, until the Cretaceous, I think, and, and the, the, the Western Gondwana supercontinent and there are, plenty of plant uh, genera and families which are either the same or they complement each other. So um, this, this knowledge of, of um, uh, medicinal plants is going to be recorded by, by Westerners who are going to, to visit these places and are going to leave um, quite a lot of information um, about the, the function. There, is, there are plenty who do, this, who do so in Africa, plenty of them, uh, Portuguese is like, uh, Portuguese like, like Travassos Valdez, um, there are, or Coster in Brazil, Coster actually talks about the Herba Cobreira, for example, which is a plant that is supposed to treat um, snake bites. Uh, and, and he actually makes very clear, he, he, his, his opinion is that this is an African plant that is imported from Africa and that is being kept in, in a very specific sort of container because they could not make it grow in Brazil. So every time that he saw it, that, that he saw it in a specific kind of container so that it could be um, they, they continue to use it. And, um, and in Africa, all over the place, winter, bottom, almost every British doctor is going to refer at some point to, um, to the way in which Africans uh, had, had amassed and, and developed this, this knowledge of botany um, in, in, their, in their native societies. Uh, so basically, Africans are going to provide an entirely new um, amount of possibilities when it came to botany for, for medical treatments and, and, and therapies. Um, uh, Daniel, for instance, uh, and, and Travassos Paldez, both of them are going to, to, to describe how they, uh, they, they also process and prepare the medicines from these plants, okay? So this information is there, it's, it's written. And yet, <clears throat> very often, they are going at the same time to undermine um, African knowledge and African practitioners. Uh, and it's going to become almost like a, like a sport. Right, they are, they are going to do it because they have to. It's, it's almost compulsory at some point in the narratives to either undermine or more often than not mock, make fun of African practitioners. Uh, and these accounts are going to come, um, are going to be produced both by slave traders on occasion uh, and, and for those opposed to human trafficking in the period. Um, these accounts are going to be, um, I like have no other words of putting it really, they are going to be racist, uh, they are going to use condescending epithets like quacks, which doctors, you, you men, uh, charlatans. 
as I said before, very often they are going to mock any sort of, of, of ritual, or religious usually, ritual that is um, uh, tied to medical practices, like for instance, dancing or any way of dressing that, that uh, um, medical practitioners are going to, to um, fissure. The, the Lander brothers, for example, <clears throat> um, they are going to call them idle, lazy fellows and, um, and, their, sorry, and, and sharing their own prejudices. Um, and ignorance, they are going to refer to their medicinal plants, and I, and I quote here, as inefficacious all, and altogether useless. When, of course, we know today there are plenty of uh, African plants that um, are being used for all sorts of uh, uh, modern medicine uh, across the world. They are also going to resent them very often, and this actually was something I, I didn't expect, for, for preferring the services of their own medical practitioners when they had the opportunity to access um, superior Western knowledge. So they, they complain quite a lot. They actually do it quite a lot. You know, we try to uh, teach them how to treat missiles, but they prefer to go on and, and treat with their own, their own doctors. And, and this happens quite a lot. And this is obviously resentment. Um, uh, and, and of course, there is going to be quite a lot of mistrust coming both ways. Uh, uh, although at the same time, very often they, they are going to trust each other. But the reality here is that there are reasons to mistrust each other because they are, the, 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 their methods at the time, the knowledge of, of, of um, what could provoke these diseases or how they would be uh, they could be treated uh, um, uh, appropriately, very often were, were very faulty. But anyway, all this is coming from very fragmentary um, uh, accounts and, and, and the knowledge that we have, to, again, is, is a bit faulty. Um, in some occasions, you, it, Westerners are going to highlight the achievements of Africans and they're going to highlight the knowledge. They are going to, to praise some of them. In particular, there is a very famous um, African practitioner who had been a slave of the, of the African company in Cape, Town, in Cape Coast Castle, uh, Dr. Sawa. And he's going to become a bit of a celebrity and, and, and um, Westerners who, who passed through Cape Coast in the 1820s and 1830s are going to say that if, if you get sick in that place during that period, you don't go and see the European doctors. You go and see Dr. Sawa because Dr. Sawa had learned um, the trade with European doctors, but he, he had surpassed all of them. Um, you also get quite a lot of um, accounts, for instance, about African practitioners embracing the, the inoculation or vaccination method against smallpox without hesitation. Quite a few of them come into contact with, with the local sheikhs of Malans and they are the first ones to, to, to embrace the method and to learn it. Um, and and um, some of, of, of these uh, Westerners who visit uh, West and West Central Africa and East Africa, this period, people like Travassos Valdez, William Daniel, Lyons McLeod, <clears throat> and Thomas with the bottom, um, are going even to mock Europeans at, at some point for failing to recognize um, the, 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 this, the, all, all that Africans had to offer to, to medical knowledge. And also on occasion, they point out that Europeans were just as superstitious or just as backwards as Africans. But again, these are exceptions. This is not going to happen all the time. One more thing that they are going to notice on both sides of Atlantic is the, the um, that, that the knowledge was not limited to knowing the properties of plants and preparing potions, say, or preparing med medicinal <clears throat> compounds, but that also they had very well honed surgical skills. And this happens on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and there are quite a few witnesses that actually leave accounts on, on how they would uh, be extremely dexterous in, in extracting the guinea worm without breaking the guinea worm. Europeans were completely useless, they could not do it. Uh, even they tried it, they could not. Um, uh, there were their, their methods of bloodletting, the copying that the, the Africans used at the time was um, uh, admired by many um, Westerners. There is a famous uh, slave trader, Theodore Canot, who is actually going to learn uh, this method. And, and some um, uh, British surgeons in Sierra Leone are actually going to stop uh, bleeding people in the European way and they're going to, to um, to adapt, uh, to, to, to um, acquire the, the African way of, of bloodletting. And the same goes, for instance, for amputation surgery. 
uh, there are at least a couple of, of uh, Western doctors that are going to recognize the superior surgical abilities of, of the Africans they have, they have met, um, and they are going to, to adopt their methods, the techniques to, to um, perform this kind of surgery. So to wrap this up, I don't want to keep you for much longer. Um, African practitioners are going to be critical uh, to the transformation of medical cultures in, in the Atlantic during this period, um, a period that is quite different to the previous period uh, because everything is going to be done uh, under the veil of illegality, which means it's more difficult to, to, um, to, to unearth what's happening. Um, they share and acquire knowledge uh, and skills, uh, and they help shaping mainstream medical knowledge pretty much as their, their Western counterparts. Um, and not, not just with the pharmacopoeia, but also with, with their, their surgical knowledge. Uh, even though they were maligned uh, very often and dismiss occasionally their efforts and their, their persistence uh, allow them to become a core element, right? Uh, on the, of the story of the struggle against disease in the transatlantic slave trade in the 19th century. Uh, and I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you. <laughs>